This is Annie Fox for Family Confidential, Secrets of Successful Parenting. My guest today is Dr. Elizabeth J. Mayer, author of Gender, Bullying, and Harassment, Strategies to End Sexism and Homophobia in Schools. My guest today is Dr. Elizabeth J. Mayer. Dr. Mayer is an assistant professor in the Department of Education at Concordia University in Montreal. A former high school teacher and coach, she is the author of Gender, Bullying, and Harassment, Strategies to End Sexism and Homophobia in Schools. While there have been countless studies of bullying and harassment in schools, none have examined the key gender issues related to these behaviors. In her book, Dr. Mayer does just that, and she offers readers tangible and flexible suggestions to help them positively transform the culture of their school and reduce the incidence of gendered harassment. Welcome to Family Confidential, Liz. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Annie. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm particularly excited to have you here as my guest because, as you may be aware, in the last six weeks, we've launched a new anti-bullying forum on Facebook called Cruels Not Cool. And in reading your book, I'm thinking, yes, this woman and I are totally kindred spirits here because you are obviously talking about a culture of cruelty that feeds in on all levels to the experience kids are having at school. And um, I'm wondering if you would please read from page seven to three of your book, which is actually a conclusion, but I think sums up a lot of what we're going to be talking about during this interview. Sure, I'd be happy to. Gender is a major factor in most incidents of bullying and harassment because it is a powerful force in shaping human behavior. Asking people to think differently about how we understand gender and how it relates to bullying, harassment, sexuality, and schooling is often controversial and challenging. Questioning traditional notions of masculinity and femininity is like tearing down the walls of the house we grew up in. These are the values that we grew up with, the rules that we spent our childhood learning to follow and decode, and the history that all of our shared stories are embedded in. They are familiar. It is what we know. They are so familiar that they have become invisible and are not talked about or re-examined. Although that childhood home can be familiar and comfortable for some, it can be restricting and suffocating for many. Unfortunately, familiar walls of gender that define so many of our behaviors and relationships don't allow for the range of identities and experiences that exist in our world. These boundaries have been carefully taught and monitored, but in order to make room for everyone, they need to be looked at, questioned, and reconstructed. Great. Thank you. That really does sum it up. And I think it would be helpful for our listeners straight off the bat if we define some terms. Can you please define for us the word bullying? The way I use that term is I use the term that's most commonly used in most of the bullying literature from Dan Olveas, the Norwegian researcher who really created this field of study. And uh, he defines bullying as any behavior um, that is repeated and intentional that over time inflicts injury on another individual. And how do you differentiate that from harassment? It is different from harassment because bullying is intentional and targeted at a specific individual, whereas harassment can be intentional or unintentional because there can be a lot of the, the jokes or the comments or the things that children learn from their families or mass media or other cultural institutions that they don't realize is hurtful or they have been taught that it's okay to say a racist thing or a religious bias or a sexist comment. And so that's how they can be unintentional. They can also be targeted or have no specific targets. And one of the best examples I give of this is sort of what happens often in like middle schools and high schools where you'll have a group of boys sitting around talking about their female peers and saying, oh, this about her body part or oh, I'd love to do that to her. They're not specifically targeting their language at the young women, but the young women hear it, they're aware of it, and it has a chilling effect on their comfort and their you know, levels of safety in school. 
And of course, it's reinforcing amongst that group of boys that this is okay. Absolutely, that this is what boys do. And if you want to be seen as a successful boy, if you want your masculinity to be without question, then you need to objectify girls sexually. You need to talk about them this way and laugh about them and rate them because that's what boys do. How interesting. And so if you're a boy who resists those values and says, that's not respectful, that's not the way I was brought up at home, then your masculinity is called into question and you're targeted for other reasons. Absolutely. One of the most common insults that are targeted against boys who say, hey, that's not okay, or don't talk about my friends that way, will say, oh, what are you, gay? Mm -hmm. And that's the most common way to question a young man's masculinity is to call his heterosexuality into question. Wow. This is so broad and so deep in terms of... (laughs) how it manifests itself on all levels of our culture. My first question to you really is, how did you get into this work, Liz? Well, it started my first year as a high school teacher. You know, I was 22, right out of college and all excited to be in the classroom. And I hadn't really thought about anything beyond, you know, French, which was what I was supposed to be teaching. I was focusing on the French, but then all these other things were happening and all these students were coming to me and saying, oh, the boys are calling me this or, oh, and I've been hearing these jokes. And and I realized that this was really having an impact on many of the students' comfort and ability to focus in my classroom. And so I spent a lot of time that year reading and going to conferences specifically about sexual and homophobic harassment because that's what the students were coming to me the most about that upset them the most. And and that's really how I, you know, genuinely came to it from the classroom teacher's perspective. So in that first year, when the girls were telling you this, and you were increasing your awareness level and getting some professional tools for dealing with it, how did you start dealing with it? Well, a lot of the things that I started with was just individual support. As a new teacher in a new school, I really wanted to start small. So I did. I listened to them. I gave them some coping strategies. I would give them books to read for support and ideas on how to handle situations themselves. But then I slowly started practicing the language myself in the classroom of saying, hey, you know, that joke is not funny. It's not okay to make comments like that about your your female peers or about gays and lesbians. And I got that, you know, from reading newsletters and from going to conferences because this was sort of pre-World Wide Web. I'm dating mm-hmm. myself a little bit here, but it was taking baby steps. And unfortunately, I tried to go a little bit higher and meet with the administration and talk to them about more systemic things we could do in the school, like starting a diversity club or having bulletin boards outside of my classroom. But my administration was really uh, resistant, to say the least. And I was really confined to sort of individualistic classroom level um, responses that I was able to to have under my own control. Anything larger than that was not really welcomed or, or accepted in the school. Well, you hit on two really important points in my mind. You say French was what you were supposed to be teaching, or so you thought when you got there. I am of the mind that when we choose the teaching profession, we have a much bigger goal in mind in terms of the character education of our students. And It also seems to me that when a teacher comes from that place and he or she gets no support from the administration or from colleagues, it's a very lonely road. It is. It's especially because I see this most in new teachers in the first, second, and third years of teaching because many of them are called to the profession because they want to make an impact in the lives of youth. They want to make a difference in our society. And so it isn't necessarily about helping students master the math or improve their punctuation. It's really about helping them be better citizens or promoting social justice or, you know, all these other larger principles. But when the way you see these things happening in the school culture contradict the kinds of things you're trying to teach in your classroom. When you're a new teacher, you're particularly vulnerable and it's hard to kind of seek out those allies and who can I talk to, who will be supportive, how far can I go before I get a reprimand, an angry parent phone call, before I, you know, sort of cross the line in terms of what's acceptable in this school culture. And that's one of the very delicate dances that 
that many teachers who feel vulnerable in schools, whether it's because they're a new teacher, whether it's because they identify as gay or lesbian, whether because they're a religious or racial minority, there's a lot of reasons that teachers feel vulnerable and powerless in their school communities. Well, I think this notion of culture and the power of the individual to change culture is very fascinating to me and, and daunting, depending on how you look at it. We've recently launched this Facebook forum on bullying, and it's not really about, oh, tell us your worst stories, because those abound in newspapers and they're horrific enough. I really set up the forum as an opportunity for parents and teachers and kids to talk about their personal experience with an eye towards solutions, things that are working, inspirational teachers that they have had who managed to shift the perspective even just within the classroom. And that made it safe enough for those kids to talk, to be heard, and to feel some sense of empowerment about themselves. And so that when the the bell rang and the door opened and they went into the wider world of that school community, they were taking some of those lessons with them. But the idea of changing culture is enormous. And you talk about it in very specific ways in the book, which I'm going to get to in a bit. But I'm wondering if when you're a new teacher looking for positions, do you try to find a school whose culture matches your own values or do you go in with a warrior stance and say, put me anywhere and I will positively impact this culture? And that's a great question and one that I get asked quite often in in the pre-service teacher education classes that I do teach. What I say to students is that when you go out on interviews, it really should be a two-way interview process because you are looking for a good fit. Because as teachers, you do teach who you are, whether you're doing it intentionally or not. Your values do shape the way you handle incidents and ask questions and interact with students in the classrooms. So I do encourage teachers to ask about how do they handle certain kinds of things, to read policies and procedures, to talk to other teachers who work there and say, okay, here's, I know this is what I've read officially, but kind of what is unofficially going on here. And even talking to the students, because yes, the individual does have a lot of power to initiate and sustain change. But if you have powerful resistance from the leadership of the school or the entrenched sort of long, you know, old guard, the teachers who've been there forever, then no matter how inspired and committed you are, it's a sure recipe for burnout. But, you know, that being said, a lot of young teachers don't have that kind of freedom and flexibility. They just want to get a job. Right. And they may get one offer and they take it. Correct. Let's talk about the role of the administrator because I've always thought, and I do a lot of work in the schools, um, mostly as just a person who comes in to do a student assembly or two, to do a teacher training or to do a parent education event. I get a sense of the school as soon as I walk in and talk to the administrator, but then I'm gone. But I certainly can't avoid noticing that the tone is set from the leadership above. I'm very interested in hearing your take on how administrators can walk that fine line because they are, in fact, they're dealing with values education and they are going to get pushed back from a lot of parents, especially when you're talking about things like sexism and homophobia. There are obviously students who grow up in homes where homophobia is some kind of a religious belief and they feel quite justified in bashing gays. Yes, and that is one of the arguments that I hear most often from teachers and administrators. Well, I can't talk about this because I have to respect the religious views of the students and the families in my school community. And what I try to help them see is I see it as sort of two things. I look at it from a human rights perspective and from sort of a diversity and um, inclusion perspective. And the way I look at it is I use a legal framework that's been used in Canada in their human rights decisions around teacher expression and religion and sexuality in schools. And it is drawing this line between beliefs and behaviors that we can't legislate beliefs and you are absolutely entitled to whatever religion, spiritual value, belief system that you have at home. And you can express those views in private and in your places of worship and exchange those views. 
But when you're in public settings, and schools are public settings, particularly publicly funded schools, that any behavior that infringes on the rights of others, that causes a discriminatory or bias-filled environment, needs to be stopped. Mm -hmm. And so we're not Though, as an educator, I do want people to question their beliefs and work towards a more equitable and socially just world, I'm not going to sit there and say you have to change your beliefs. At the bare minimum, I will sit there and say you need to change your behaviors because any time you have a behavior that is going to disrupt or make somebody feel unsafe or not welcome, that is not acceptable in a school community. That's great, and it's a very clear-cut way of putting it. And it seems to me that any reasonable person regardless of their beliefs, would want their children to be mindful of the feelings of others. Absolutely, because that's something that you share universally, because many religious minorities who have um, firmly held beliefs feel that they get discriminated against in school communities, and they'd want that same kind of respectful treatment. Mm -hmm. And so it's a really um, easy framework that teachers and administrators can use to say, you know, this is how we can create this context of inclusion and respecting diversity by truly respecting everybody's, you know, multiple views and values and contributions in our school community. So I'm guessing that people who call you in, you do community-based trainings of this kind of anti-bullying work or, or bullying awareness and prevention work? Yes. Yeah, so, and, you know, I'll, I'll speak at teachers conventions or be invited into schools or school districts, you know, depending on what the need is or what the issues are for that particular group. Okay, so my guess is that any school that would invite you is aware there is a problem and they're seeking, they're knocking on your door for some help in formulating solutions that are community-based. Yes, that is an essential first step is acknowledging <laughs> and recognizing that there is a problem. So you've already got them. In fact, they've, they've come to you and saying we need help. So you've got some willing participants there, probably starting from the administration because they invited you. Right. At the very minimum, I've got at least one, you know, ally on the administration. But sometimes people invite me in because they are afraid of sort of the legal repercussions if they don't do this kind of training. So it's not mm -hmm. that they're sort of, you know, invested in the issue. It's that they're protecting their assets. <laughs> <laughs> well put. So um, tell us a little bit about what those trainings might look like. Do they typically happen on a Saturday or a day where many members of the community can attend? Well, they're generally part of the professional development days for a school. Okay, so that means teachers and administrators and counselors. Right. Since most of my listeners are parents and not professional educators, I would love to be a fly on the wall as you describe what some of these public forums in the evenings are like. Oftentimes, there's sort of a, a town hall where the community has realized there's an issue about this and they just want to learn more about it and what are the resources that they currently have available to help. So I'll often, you know, just do a short 20-minute presentation on my research, um, which primarily focuses on teachers, what they can do, why they might not intervene, and what schools can do to help them be more effective in intervening, but also just providing some of the facts and figures that we do know about bullying and harassment and its impacts on youth. I do focus a lot on the cultural influences um, that might influence certain kids to engage in bullying and harassing behaviors, so parents are aware of the role that they can have in shaping the behavior of their kids. Unfortunately, what we know is that the parents who are motivated and involved and might come out and participate in these things are the ones who are less likely to have some of those kinds of issues with their children. That's very interesting. Now, I just recently got some feedback. I posted 10 tips for helping your kids survive harassment from a mean girl or a guy. And someone said, great list. Can you give us a similar list for if your kid may be the mean girl or guy? And I think for parents, it's often very difficult to see, A, that their own kid may be engaging in this kind of behavior, and B, what they as parents have done possibly to contribute to those values. It's a big step for a parent to realize that they may have had a role in contributing to a student's behavior in that way. And I don't think many parents 
really have that awareness that, you know, the the jokes or the comments they make when they're watching the news are breathed in every day by their kids. And so they might be saying specifically to them, don't bully or don't call people names. Yet when somebody in particular is on the news or they hear something on the radio, they'll make some offhanded joke or denigrating comment. So the kid really learns what the parent really thinks. So that would be one of my first comments for for parents is that to be more aware of the ways that you respond to popular culture in your household, the way you make passive comments and jokes, because that's where a lot of our true values are exposed. Mm -hmm. So even though you might sit down and have that heart to heart talk, what happens, you know, 95% of the time is not that intentional, carefully thought out parental conversation. It's just kind of what happens. And so parents do need to be a little bit more aware of the kinds of behaviors the kids are just absorbing just by having their eyes and ears open. And so once parents start becoming more aware of those those kinds of things and the behaviors that their peer group are engaging in, right? The parents of their friends and Mm -hmm. things like that, helping their kids be able to discern, okay, that's sort of a comment that shouldn't be repeated. And to have those conversations, watch those TV shows with your kids, play video games with your kids. So you see what they're being exposed to and how they're responding to it. Because then you can engage in deeper conversations when you engage in things that your kids care about. You have a a better shared language and you share a little bit more of their culture and you can then have a little bit greater influence over their behaviors that way. It's really important to show the interest to enter their world on that level and see what other influences are working on the heart and mind of your kids. I think as parents, we feel pretty much on top of things when the kids are young. There was a feeling of less control in middle school and even less control as your kids got older in high school. But it seems to me the role of social media has lowered the age level for where those cultural influences start acting on your kid. I'm curious to hear your input on guidelines for parents in terms of that kind of online exposure to a wider culture? We know that adolescence is the time when when kids are really trying to seek out their own identities, separate themselves from their parents. And so the influence of the peer group becomes huge. So no matter what parents say and do, we know that whatever is perceived as cool by their peers is going to have so much greater impact on the behavior and the choices of our children. And that's a natural developmental stage, we might add. Absolutely. Absolutely. But as far as social media and the internet and things like that, I know many people who do work in cyberbullying and talking about sort of the threats of the anonymity of all of these sort of chat rooms and um, form spring and Facebook and places like that can really be dangerous places. But again, I feel like these are huge opportunities for parents to understand their children better and for children to seek out all kinds of new sources of information, particularly youth who might be gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, or questioning their gender or sexual identity. People who are racial and religious minorities, they find a lot of strength and community Mm -hmm. in these chat rooms and in these social networking opportunities, Um, whether it be through shared music and art and YouTube videos and things like that. It really is an identity forming participatory experience for youth. So it's not all bad. And most of the time, it's actually quite healthy. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of constantly having those conversations with your kids. And, you know, what we do know about cyberbullying is that most kids don't report it to their parents because they're afraid of losing their access to that (laughs) community. And so though you do want to protect your children, using the loss of the internet as a response to some, you know, negative behaviors will keep your students, keep your children from feeling okay to tell you about what is going on. So creating that culture of openness in your family, that it's okay to tell me, I'm not going to punish you, I'm not going to take things away from you. Mm -hmm. We're just going to work together as a family unit to find ways to make you feel safer, make you feel supported, make you feel loved and appreciated when you've had a negative experience. Mm -hmm. That's really good. I I hate the knee-jerk reaction you hear from many parents. It's just like, well, just take it away from them. You're paying for it. Just take it away from them. And for many kids, as you say, it's a very positive experience, especially if they're not experiencing a lot of social connection at school. 
to be able to go online and have a community of accepting friends. There's that aspect of social media. The other part is the cell phone and the IMing, which is not so much destination websites for social connections, but more of a tool for sometimes harassment and bullying of other students. I kind of think of it as giving kids who are engaging in that kind of behavior bigger guns with which to do it. And the impact on the targets is much greater because it's unrelenting. Yes, I agree. And that's why I think cyberbullying has gotten so much attention because all it's really done is taken the behaviors that, you know, many of us experienced in childhood, whether it be... And the values. Yeah, whether it be the nasty notes or the rumors or the name calling. And like you said, amplifying it, it's giving them a megaphone and giving it some kind of permanency. Mm -hmm. But the good side of that, even though it is sort of prevalent and there seems like no place where kids can escape it sometimes, it does provide documentation and proof. So that's one of the things that have always been kind of the he said, she said thing that prevents teachers and schools and parents from getting involved in bullying. Well, at least if you have a text message or you have evidence from an IM conversation, then you have the transcript. You know exactly what happened and you can have a more productive productive way forward to say, hey, let's call this family or, hey, let's get the school involved or, hey, you know, these are some other things that we can do to make sure you're not going to be experiencing this kind of negative behaviors anymore. And that's great as long as your kid lets you know it's going on or you have an awareness that something is going on and you have enough trust in your relationship with your child that you can open the space for them to say, yeah, well, I'm kind of having a fight with these kids and a lot of it is getting really nasty. And and then you might say, I'd like to see some of it. Yeah. Make it really safe. Yeah, that trust and openness is so important. And it's hard because, again, when we talk about kids who are being bullied, whether they're being called gay or queer or fag or lesbo, when those terms are used and when that's the theme... Mm -hmm. Kids many times don't want to tell their parents because they're afraid the parents are going to say, well, are you? And then it, then it becomes about the victim. <laughs> right. And so that's another thing that parents say, you know, what, regardless of the language that's being used, if it's hurtful to the child, then it needs to be addressed as language that's hurtful to that child. And don't deal with anything else around that until your child is ready to have that conversation with you. You can't, whether you think you have your own suspicions about your child's sexual orientation or gender identity... It's nice to let them know that the door is open for that conversation, but you can't kick it down either. (laughs) Okay, so then what about a case where the child says, okay, I'll talk to you, but you have to promise you're not going to do anything about this. And then all this is disclosed. You see the transcript of the text messages back and forth. You're, You're absolutely appalled and your maternal instincts or paternal instincts kick in and you want to do whatever you can to protect the well-being of your child, and your child is begging you, do not call the school, do not call their parents. What do you do? And that's a tricky spot. You know, I was put in as a teacher as well. I mean, you don't want to violate the trust of your child. And so when your child says there's something I want to tell you, but you have to promise not to tell anybody else, one of the first things I would say is I can keep that promise as long as the information that you share with me isn't that it's going to hurt somebody or hurt yourself. And because then, you know, as that was sort of as my professional standards, I do have a duty to respond. But as a parent, you don't have that same professional duty. But you might want to be clear with your child that I want to listen and I want to work on solutions together with you. I want to be able to support you. So it's hard for me to make promises until I know everything that's going on. So I would caution parents from making promises that they might not end up being able to keep because then you're going to violate that trust. And that you can say, I would like to take action, but then slowly come up with a plan with your child that your child feels comfortable with. So your child feels like they have some control and some agency over the situation because that's one of the worst things about being targeted is you feel completely out of control. And so you can't take it completely out of your child's hands. You need to work with them as a team and hopefully support and coach them into taking action so it doesn't continue. When is it time to change schools, Liz? Oh, that's a hard, hard question. But honestly, if you've got a child who is sick all the time 
or you know has been skipping or late to class all the time and you're seeing it's having an impact on their academic performance or their physical health, that is when, you know, it's definitely gone too far. And clearly the school, even if you've already notified them or even if you haven't, they're not doing enough and it might be time to make that change. You obviously don't want things to get so bad that, that the child is hurting themselves. So you do want to pay attention to those warning signs where, wow, my kid seems to be sick and not wanting to go to school a lot. That's a common um, symptom of kids just kind of avoiding just going there mm -hmm. or even just talking to the teachers and, and seeing if they know what else is going on. But oftentimes it is under the radar of the adults. So you just need to be tuned into your child. And anytime you see their grades change, changing or their attitude towards school changing, you need to have a frank conversation with them and say, maybe we should try a different school. And, you know, that that happened to my niece and it was about a year and a half. And finally, her mom just said, the school's not doing enough. We've worked with them. We're going to put you in a new school. And it changed everything. Mm. Yeah, because we all deserve to feel safe. I mean, who wants to go back into a snake pit every day and feel tormented and invalidated and mocked. I mean, you, you can't blame a child for not wanting to go and to come up with any excuse to avoid it. You know, I'm thinking on two levels here as a parent and also as an educator myself. I'm thinking about that child who needs to be in a safer place and whose parents say, okay, we're changing schools. When they notify the school, now I'm switching my perspective to the school administration. Then that student leaves and the kids who are tormenting say, yes, we got rid of her. Vicky, what kind of message is that? Well, I think what it is, is a message to the school administrators that you have some snakes in your community. And it's not just about, oh, we got rid of this one annoying kid that we didn't like. It should be a red flag to the administrator that these kids have a powerful influence over the culture and the well-being of that school and the students in that school. Yeah. And so although the kids might feel like, okay, yeah, we've won, they need to be given notice as well that the school is well aware of the kinds of behaviors they've been engaging in and that they are going to be you know, more closely monitored and that they should not expect to be able to turn their attentions to others without having consequences. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things is that many of these students are seen as very sort of charismatic leaders in the school community. Yes. Oftentimes they're the popular kids. Oh, of course. <laughs> you know, it's not just the mean bully who just beats kids up for their lunch money. That stereotype is so dated and, mm -hmm. and counterproductive. And a lot of teachers, administrators kind of need to take their blinders off and realize some of the people that they think are the leaders and the stars in their school community are the worst perpetrators of this. Absolutely. You know, in your section where you're talking about solutions, and I love it, you talk about the role of the administration, the teachers, the parents, and the students, which is a piece that's often somehow neglected in most models of dealing with this stuff. You talk about the use of student leaders, and I, I would love for you to expound on that a little bit. Because if, in fact, the popular kids who, from the force of their personality and their charisma, are very willing and able to get other kids to do what they say, how do you turn leadership into a positive thing? Or do you tap other kids? <laughs> I always have sort of a both and approach that obviously, you know, you get the leadership of the school hopefully has that role modeling and, and showing it through their interactions with teachers and students and that sort of thing. But then the way I talk about it in my book is doing some very intentional, whether it be weekend retreats or at the end of the summer before the school year, getting the student council together, getting some team captains together, getting other charismatic leaders in the school together and giving them a training on sort of the mission and values of the school and having diversity and respect and conversations about friendship groups and cliques and bullying and harassment. And then giving them some of those skills, giving them that awareness and that expectation that in, as leaders of the school, we're asking you to set the tone for this community. And oftentimes what I've seen schools do quite successfully is having an orientation for the new ninth graders arriving or the new sixth graders arriving and saying, these are the cultures and values of our school, and they have the older kids part of that workshop pairing with the younger kids saying, these are the kinds of things that might have happened at your old school that you will learn quickly are not tolerated here. And so you get it peer-to-peer -peer coaching really is so effective. And then, you know, things that happen outside of the eyesight and earsight of 
teachers and administrators, you've got the kids there saying, hey, that's not cool or hey, knock it off. Mm -hmm. And that's often all you need because then the kids realize, oh, okay, that's not cool here. I really shouldn't be acting that way. Well, this is great and very encouraging. And I hope in addition to what you've just outlined, that those peer counselors and peer leaders also have an ongoing forum with a faculty advisor, uh, something that's in place ongoing, not just, well, we gave you a training at the orientation and now you're on your own. Because I think, as you know, drama happens in every aspect of school life and there are twists and turns. And in the same way that teachers need to be supported by their colleagues and their administration, student leaders need to be supported by the administration and their teachers. Absolutely. It does need to be consistent. It does need to be revisited. It can't be just sort of this one-time thing. Look, we did it. We're better now. Mm -hmm. That's the fault of a lot of these anti-bullying interventions is they'll bring in a big name speaker for a day of workshops and say, look, we've done it. Exactly. Not realizing that within two to three years, you've got a whole new batch of students. You know, a lot of your faculty have changed and you've got to constantly revisit, reinforce and move towards that vision. And you can't just do it once and say, okay, we've done our job. I know that you've been doing this since you were 22 <laughs> on some <laughs> level working either with your individual students or on a much broader level as you are now. What do you see in terms of trends in this area? Are things getting better? Are people getting more committed to acknowledging that there is a problem and working on solutions? Absolutely. Without a doubt, there is an increased awareness. I mean, the amount of research that's been done on this, the amount of new materials and workshops and conferences that are abounding on topics related to bullying and harassment have just increased exponentially in the past 20 years. Unfortunately, many of them take this sort of individualistic behavioral model to just no name calling, zero tolerance, and that's the end of that. The problem with those models is they tend to not get at the deeper cultural biases that tend to shape the language and the attitudes that inform a lot of those behaviors. So in the past five to seven years, I've seen a slow emergence of other kinds of workshops and research and approaches that really get at this whole family of behaviors in a more integrated and holistic way. And I find that really encouraging. Well, I find this book really encouraging, and I want to thank you so much, Liz, for taking the time to talk to us about this topic. We know that hoping things will be better if your child has been victimized this past school year, hoping things will be better in the new school year is not a very effective anti-bullying strategy. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank you. My guest has been Elizabeth J. Mayer author of Gender, Bullying, and Harassment, Strategies to End Sexism and Homophobia in Schools. Before we sign off, Liz, can you please tell us where my listeners can get more information about your work and what you do? Well, I do have a blog on Psychology Today. So if you just go to psychologyday.com, you can um, click on blogs and you'll find my blog on gender and schooling. I also am a professor at Concordia University here in Montreal. So I have a faculty web page. But the most comprehensive sort of central site for all of my information is I've got a Google site. So if you just Google Elizabeth J. Meyer, M-E-Y-E-R, you'll be able to find my, my web page that has all kinds of information about book events, my blogs, my Twitter feed, various publications and presentations, and how to get in touch with me if I can come and help your community or your school. Thank you so much for the work you do, Liz. It's greatly needed, and you're a shining light. Thank you for having me, Annie. This is Annie Fox for Family Confidential. To learn more about my work with tweens, teens, and parents, visit AnnieFox.com. And tune in next time when my guests will be Rachel Sarah and Dr. Leah Klugness, a.k.a. Dr. Leah. These two powerhouse women are co-founders of SingleMommyhood.com. I'll be talking with each of them about their work together and about their respective books, Single Mom Seeking and The Complete Single Mother. Till then, happy parenting! <music>